Well, good morning. I'm going to let him adjust the sound for a minute. I sound like I'm in a box. How about you? I'll test that out a little bit. If it's fair to say, I've been here twice. This is my third time. Mike's decided to give me three chances, and after that, it's like baseball. If you don't hit it by then, you're out. And somebody in the back said, you must, Mike must like you or you would not be here. And everybody said, yeah. But I don't know too many people that Mike doesn't like, right? Anyway, it's glad to be here. Great to be worshiping with you this morning. I'm not going to throw the first pianist under the bus, but I asked her what time the service was over, and she said this service was over at 9.30. And I said, well, actually, I first asked her what time was Sunday school, and you said you thought it was 9.45, but the service was over at 9.30. She did not want to give the pastor an extra 15 minutes today. You'll stand by that? <laughs> she was giving me the look, though, like, better tell the truth. Yeah. It's always great to be here this morning. Thank you for being uh, here this, today. Turn to your neighbor and say, I don't care what he says, but you're looking good this morning. All right. Uh, take your Bible, if you have your Bible this morning, and open your Bible to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Mike, today... As you know, at a funeral uh, earlier this week, had to come back from Oklahoma, and he is with his son Travis today. And I don't know about you, but it's such a joy for a pastor to have a son who's a pastor. I have two sons uh, who are in the pulpit this morning, and he has, I think, one, right, who is in the pulpit. And he's having the joy of going to, um, I keep getting the name of the church wrong, Kentucky Town. I keep wanting to call it Frank Town, but it's Kentucky Town. And I was with Travis actually two Sundays ago, had the joy of preaching for him while he was out of town, and it's not very, uh, actually I can't remember a time when I have preached for the son and the father within just a couple of weeks of each other, so it's kind of a joy to, to be able to do that today. Uh, the title of our study this morning is Navigating What's Next, to navigate what's next, and I think this is an important passage for us because here we learn about Solomon, who is king, who is writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is giving his son Rehoboam some insight on how to navigate through life. And out of the almost 800, approximately 800 proverbs in this book, these are two that I think are important for us to consider as we learn how to navigate in the life that God has called us to live on a day-by-day -day basis that often brings unexpected things, some unwanted, many unplanned. I don't care how you try to protect or preserve or to plan out your life, there's always something that's a little out of whack or something that's going to happen that is unwanted, uh, maybe undeserved, maybe not planned for, maybe something not expected. And so it's important for us, I think, to understand that there are places that we can go in Scripture like this one to help us understand exactly how we can navigate through the ups and downs and the opportunities of life. So if you would, stand with me in honor of God's Word. In Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to read out loud verses 5 and verse 6. So. Turn to your neighbor and say, let's use your outside voice, not your inside voice. My wife used to tell our children, when they were inside, use your inside voice, not your outside voice. Always trying to get them quieter. She's a very quiet person. She'll be here at the 11 o'clock service. But anyway, today we're going to use our outside voice, all right? Can we do that? All right, let's read it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. Father, thank you for the joy, the privilege, and the opportunity we have to stand in honor of your holy, inerrant, and infallible word. And we pray that as we open your word today, that you would open our minds and hearts. Help us to understand, to comprehend, but to apply what we learn in the scriptures today. For your glory, for the advancement of your kingdom, in order for your will to be done, we ask that you do that in us and through us today, through your church, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I don't know if you remember me being here before or not. I think it was last fall was the last time I was here. And uh, I grew up in South America, Brazil. My parents were international missionaries. Uh, when I was uh, seven years old, they shipped us on a boat to South America, Brazil. I grew up there until I was 18, came back at 18 years old, had never been behind a steering wheel of a car. If you think driving in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex is bad, you should be in Brazil. All right? If you've ever been to a foreign country, you know how sometimes it can be a little bit more treacherous than even our highways can be. 
And uh, so when I came back at 18 and I started college, I guess that summer it was time for me to find an automobile. We purchased uh, an automobile, and uh, my father took me to a parking lot, sat me in the driver's seat, gave me the best instructions that a father could ever give his son on how to drive. That's the pedal, that's the wheel, that's the six shift, and all that. And uh, so here we go. We were starting driving around in the parking lot, and then eventually we went out of the highways and the byways, the streets of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Now keep in mind that was about a few decades ago when Dallas-Fort Worth was much smaller, as was Whitesboro, and uh, a lot less treacherous, and I learned how to drive. Went and took the test, passed the driving test, and uh, took off in my Ford Pinto. Anybody know what a Ford Pinto looked like? Man, that was some hot wheels. I'm telling you what, it was something else. It had, a, it had a, a, an eight-track in it, all right? I mean, it was something else. A hatchback, it was cool. Uh, jump ahead 20 more years. Uh, I have a son who is Matthew. He is our pastor. We are members of the Trails Church in Salina. Our son is our pastor. Be nice to your children. He may be your pastor someday. And uh, so uh, uh, he was time for him to drive, 16, 15, 16. So I got in the pastor's seat. He got in the driver's seat. I, as a father, passed along my instructions to him as to how to safely navigate through the streets of the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. And sure enough, we ventured out into the streets at some point, And he drove for a while, went and got his driver's license. And we watched him drive off, and we thought, you know, Lord have mercy. And uh, we prayed a lot during those early days. Jump back a couple of more decades. Just two years ago, our oldest grandson, I know I don't look old enough to have a grandson old enough to drive, but just a little bit over a year ago, I saw my son drive up. He is in the passenger seat. Caden, who is now 16, in the driver's seat. And I'm thinking, my soul, my grandson is driving. Now, it's, it's hard enough for fathers to see their sons driving, to see their grandchildren driving, and to think you're that old that your grandchildren are driving. Amen, grandparents? And uh, so I'm watching my son instruct his son how to drive and how to navigate through the highways and the dangers of now the metropolitan area of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which is incredibly crazy, right? That's why we live here. I live in Collinsville, smaller than Whitesboro. I don't like venturing into the streets of the Dallas. I mean, anywhere south, it's crazy. You know what I'm talking about? These people are nuts. And uh, it is said that most, most accidents are caused by human error. And as a result of that, God understands that when he gives us the scriptures because he knows that as human beings, we are prone to error and we need guidance. We need direction. We need someone to, to, to tell us, to instruct us, to guide us on how to navigate through whatever comes next in life because of the uncertainties and the unsecurities and the, the things that can happen. We need an anchor. We need something to latch onto. We need someone to help us not only cope through, but make it through the things that will happen in life. And so here in this proverb, I want us to understand there are four things that I think are important for us to understand. First of all, we navigate through life, we navigate through what's next by respecting God's sovereignty. By respecting God's sovereignty. Notice what it says in the text in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. God is sovereign. He is sitting, he is reigning, he is ruling on his throne. He is not an absentee landlord. He does not take a vacation. He does not ever go oops. He never sees something not coming. He knows what happens not only in the past, but the present and the future. He is sovereign. He is God. And as, as God, he is the one that we need to respect and we need to trust. It is in him that we place our trust in as we navigate through the ups and downs, the insecurities, the uncertainties, and the unimaginables of life. Notice the text, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. The word trust means to put your confidence, to put your hope in, to put your faith in something or someone else outside of yourself. This word trust is an imperative, which simply means it is a command. It is not an option for us who are the children of God in whom we are to place our trust in. I think often we put our trust in each other and other things, 
and even sometimes the government. But here it says that the object of our trust is none other than God himself, the Lord himself, Jehovah, Yahweh, God. It is in him that we place our trust and in no one else, including ourselves. Trust in the Lord. How? How are we to trust in him? With all your heart. I don't need to explain to you what A-L-L means, do I? He means all. It means everything. It means without holding anything back. Trust in the Lord with all, notice, your heart, all of your will, your mind, your conscience, your understanding. To trust Him completely and totally with every aspect of your life. To trust Him wholeheartedly, without reservation, everything, every desire, every affection, every decision, every goal, every objective. To trust in the Lord with your all with everything that you have, holding nothing back. Now, to help us illustrate that, I want to go to a passage that may be familiar to you in the passage of Matthew chapter 19. So put your finger there in Proverbs uh, 3, 5, and 6, and turn with me to Matthew 19. Let's illustrate this in a New Testament sort of a way, where we see where Christ is traveling along a road, and as he's making his journey, he is interrupted on this journey by a young man. Mark, Mark, I believe, says that he is a rich young ruler. And this rich young ruler approaches Christ. You know the story. He said, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. I'm not quite sure if I'm doing the right things in order to inherit or to measure up to the standard that's going to qualify me for eternal life. Can you help me out? Jesus responds to the man by saying, Obey the commandments. He then responds, which ones? Interesting, Christ gives him five commandments plus one. The plus one that he gives him is to love your neighbor as yourself, which is not included in one of the Ten Commandments. And uh, the man looks at Christ and boldly proclaims, I've done those since I was a young man, since my youth. Christ says, really? He's thinking to himself, you think you've measured up to all of the commandments. You've measured up to the standard. You're a perfect man. Really? I mean, to think about it, if the guy was sure about his salvation and the fact that he had done everything that he could to measure up to the standard of the qualification for eternal life, he wouldn't be coming to Christ to ask him the question, correct? But nonetheless, Christ gives him the answer, and he says, well, here's what I want you to do. If you believe you've done that, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. But notice the response of the man in verse 22. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful. Why? He had great possessions. Arguably, you and I can probably sit here and debate what is the reason why this man did not follow Christ. He loved money more than he loved the Lord. I think it's a much deeper issue than that, really. I think this man was simply not willing to trust Christ with his all. Notice he said, what must I do to be saved? He was not looking for someone to do for him what he didn't believe he could do for himself. And he also was not wanting to relinquish the security that he had in his own wealth, in his own resources, to someone else to manage rather than him doing it himself. In other words, he was holding on to himself and to the things that he had done or could do and the resources that he possessed. He was not willing to trust with his all. I think sometimes you and I need to understand that when we come to faith in Christ, we must trust Christ with our all. We abandon our own self-effort and recognize and realize that we need someone greater and beyond ourselves to do for us what we cannot do, and that is to save us from our sin against God. And by grace through faith, we put our trust and faith in Jesus, who does for us on the cross and through the resurrection what we could not do for ourselves, to give us salvation and to die in our place and therefore save us from our sin against God. And then after we give him our all in that respect, we somehow think, as we navigate through this life in the course of following Christ as disciple, that we then now are sitting in the driver's seat, dictating, determining the direction and the decision of our lives. If we are to trust God with our all at salvation, we are to continue to live that way for the rest of our journey as disciples of Christ, holding back nothing from him not only at salvation, but post-salvation by coming to him open-handed, open-hearted, open-minded, and say, Lord, it's my all. I lay it all in the altar every single day. 
I don't know about you, but it's a daily decision for me. And how about you? I don't know about you, but I like to sit in the driver's seat. I have a truck. My wife doesn't drive my truck. I drive my truck. Can I get amen, guys? I've always thought of a lady who drives a truck to be a special lady, but my lady is a little bitty lady, and she doesn't drive a great big truck. So anywhere we go, we drive in my truck, and I get to drive. Why? Why do you think? Come on. It's my truck, but I like to be in the driver's seat. Right? How about you? Do you like to be in the driver's seat with your life? You know you do. But when we come to faith in Christ, we relinquish control and our self-sufficiency and we surrender our all to the Lord. And now it is He that is in control, not us. And that's a decision I need to make every morning when I get out of bed and put my feet on the floor and begin my day. I need to say, Lord, I'm going to trust in you with all my heart today, with my finances, with my resources, with my job with my marriage, with my children, with my grandchildren, with my sickness, with whatever comes. We lay it on the altar and we give it to the Lord and we trust Him with our all. So in order for it to accomplish this parable, we need to respect the sovereignty of God, but we also need to rest in the understanding of the Lord. We need to rest in God's understanding. Notice he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The word and is a conjunction. It's there by design. The Holy Spirit never inspires the writers of the Bible to put a word there that's just to fill in the blank. There's a reason for this conjunction to being here is because the Holy Spirit is wanting us to understand that what has been said before is going to precede what is about to be said. They are linked, they are joined together. In other words, trusting in the Lord with all your heart also means you must lean not on your own understanding. In order for me to trust in the Lord with all my heart, I do not need to lean on my own understanding. And lean not. That is a double negative, which means that you are in absolutely no way to lean on your own understanding. What does it mean to lean on? You ever seen a, a preacher kind of lean on the pulpit when they preach? You ever seen that? Why do they do that? It's to kind of give them some stability, some security, or maybe uh, something to hold on to. Um, the seat of the chair that you're in or the pew that you're in right now, why are you sitting in it? When you came in this morning, did you analyze it, took a look at it, saying, I think this will hold me up today, so I think I'll sit in it. He just automatically took it by experience. Subconsciously, you looked at the pew that you're sitting in and you made an assessment recognize and realize it can hold you up so therefore you sat in it and now you are resting in it you're leaning on it you are depending upon it to hold you up right now in this present moment right you're leaning on it you're depending on it you're resting in it and so he says and lean not don't rest in don't rely upon don't relax in don't exercise your own understanding that which belongs to you your understanding your perception your perspective your understanding your insight your intellect your experience do not lean on your own understanding don't lean on your own perspective did you know that everything you perceive is not reality let me ask you that again did you know that everything you perceive is not reality turn the person next to you and say he's talking about you he's not talking about me Look him back in the eye and said, you too, bub. There are a lot of things that we perceive. We perceive because we have the wrong understanding. And as a result of that, the Lord says that our thoughts are not his thoughts. Therefore, our ways are not always his ways. Every perception that we have is not God's. And so he says, lean not on your own understanding. You perceive something to be reality and you act upon it that's why we need to go to the lord and say lord what is your perspective what is your understanding regarding my circumstance my situation and what is happening and he says and lean not on your own understanding let's look at an old testament example in joshua chapter 7 keep your finger in proverbs and turn to joshua chapter 7 
for an Old Testament illustration of what we're talking about. In Joshua chapter 6, the people of God have crossed over the Jordan. They are making their way into that which God had promised, the possession of the promised land. And they come across in Joshua 6, in a city that you're familiar of, a city named Jericho. It's a fortified city. It's a magnificent city. And upon investigation, it seems impenetrable, seems invincible. But God gives Joshua the strategy to bring down the wall so that he can occupy and possess that which God has promised. They're to watch, walk around the city six times. On the seventh day, on the seventh time, they're to blow the trumpet and shout. I don't know about you, but that, does that defy your understanding? Come on, really. How many, how many deacons do we have here? Would that be something a deacons meeting you decide to do to, as a strategy to conquer what God has promised? How about a committee member? You're a committee member here? Can you imagine in a Baptist committee meeting, somebody suggested that, that this is the way that we do to occupy the land? Somebody look at them and say, you're nuts. Or maybe in a, I don't know, a quarterly business meeting, somebody stands up and makes a suggestion like this, and everybody probably looking at them, that, that person is just, they're not with it today. That's what God prescribed. This is beyond their understanding, yet it's the what God prescribed. They exercise and they do exactly what God prescribed and the walls come tumbling down upon the moment they shouted and they possess that which God had promised. Shortly after that, the next adventure is Ai, a small, insignificant city, much like Collinsville, not very attractive, not having a whole lot of, of protection, not seeming invincible. And so they go to spy out the land and the spies come back with a report. Notice the report in Joshua 7, verse 3. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. In their assessment, in their understanding, they assume that Ai is a small, insignificant, easily overtaken city. Therefore, let's don't take all the warriors, all the troops up there. Just take three thousand. What we then learn after this is they do exactly what was recommended and upon the battle they are defeated drastically. 36 men are killed. They run in fear of their lives and the Bible says that all of Jerusalem was in fear and loss of hope. It isn't until later that Joshua goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what happened? And he discovers that there is sin in the camp because someone had taken what belonged to the Lord in Jericho they didn't have the favor of the Lord to go forward. Now, in Ai, they didn't even consider consulting with the Lord. They didn't ask the Lord at all what they should do. Why? I mean, after an incredible victory like they had against Jericho, why do we need to go to him with this little thing called Ai? Does that sound familiar to you? The reality is, are there any small battles? Are there any lower obstacles that we must overcome are there any challenges that we think lord i can handle this i don't need you i can proceed on my own i have experience i have understanding i have education i have talent i've done something greater before than what i'm about to do so therefore i'm just gonna just gonna engage and just gonna make it happen and the end result is what always not what we had hoped especially not what the lord wanted we need to rest not in our own understanding, but look to God for the understanding that we need if we hope to navigate through whatever God brings into your life. Thirdly, we need to respond to God's guidance. In this second parable, uh, parable proverb, we see verse 6 that it goes with verse 7. Notice he says, as we respond to God's guidance, verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, connected to that. The movement that should take us toward the next verse is in all your ways. Acknowledge him in is a preposition of direction. It tells, tells us that we are to in all your ways. The word all does not need defining for us, does it? Leaves nothing out in all whose ways? Your ways, my ways, our ways, the conduct, the character, the the path, the actions that we take. So in all of our actions, in all of our 
understandings, in all of our directions, in all your ways, acknowledge him. The word acknowledge has a word in it. It's called know, isn't it? Acknowledge. Knowledge comes from knowing. We gain knowledge by knowing. We know the Lord. And having known the Lord, we go to him, acknowledging him for who he is. As sovereign God, reigning and ruling on his throne, who alone is all-wise, all-knowing, and who has the wisdom that we need to guide us in the direction that we need to go. It's, an, a, it's a, a humble act on our part where we humbly come before the Lord, lifting him up higher than ourselves, asking him to lead us and to guide us. In other words, Lord, be our GPS. Anybody know what those things are? A GPS? I don't know about you, but sometimes I put on my GPS just because I don't want to think while I'm driving. Anybody like that other than me? I like to have some lady telling me where to turn. That's just supposed to be a joke. Don't get them. This will be my last time here, I'm sure. But anyway, <laughs> not that Mike would probably say the same thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and sometimes, come on, let's be honest. We think we know better than our GPS. Because I, I think sometimes that voice in the GPS comes from California. They don't live around here. Right? I don't know the best way. It's a way, but it's not the best way. And sometimes we listen and sometimes we don't. And we wait for the, that voice to correct itself. I don't know about you, but sometimes my voice takes a long time before it corrects itself. And I, sometimes I just then turn her off. You know, we need, to, we need to look to God to be our GPS. There's an illustration for that in John chapter 6. Take your Bible and turn to John 6. Let's look at two verses, verse 5 and verse 6. In John 6, 5 and 6, Jesus is in Galilee. He's making the trip. Uh, he tells his disciples to go to the other side of the sea. He dismisses the crowd. Uh, he climbs up a hill and the disciples are coming toward him and then he notices that a crowd is coming as well. And notice what happens in verse 5. Lifting up his eyes then, he's seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him. Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? It's a fair question. It's time for the Jewish Passover. It's time to eat. They're hungry. Maybe they're hangry, right? And it's time to eat something. And there's not a store close by. They're out in the middle of nowhere on the side of a mountain with 5,000 men plus women and children. Where are we? I like that we. Jesus includes himself in the we. Right? Where are we? He doesn't ever leave us out dangling on our own. Where are we? I'm with you in this decision. But notice verse 6. I don't know if you ever noticed this or not. He said to, notice, test him. For he himself knew what he would do. He put Philip to the test because he already knew what he would do. He's never surprised by anything. The Lord sees the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. He never is caught off guard, unprepared, and unknowing about what to do. And so when he turns to his disciple, and that's Philip, what are we going to do? He did that to testing for he himself knew what he was already going to do. And it's important when we are, are, are faced with a challenge or an obstacle like this that we turn to the Lord who already knows in advance when we get there what he intends to do when we do get there because he's already prepared a way. Interesting in the passage you learn that Andrew comes up to him and says, hey, we have five fish and two loaves, but what is this to feed so many? Ever thought about that? Why well, would he even bring that to Christ in the first place if he knew it wasn't enough, if he knew it wasn't sufficient? I think it's because God always wants us just to bring our insufficiency to him so that he can multiply it and use it for his glory. And so he brings what he has. He says, not enough. And Christ prays over that. And here's the funny thing. In Mark, and, and, and you put them together, Christ divides up the two fish and the five loaves to the 12 disciples I don't know how he divided up but he divides it up I don't know how you divide up two fish among 12 people and five pieces of bread or whatever however he did it 
And then he says, go feed them. Now, what would you do? I don't know about you, but I go, you've got to be kidding me. This is not enough. But the disciples follow the guidance, the leadership, the direction of Christ, and they proceed to distribute the fish and the bread. And after their feeding, 5,000 men are filled, plus women and children, and they come back and put everything in the leftover piles. How many baskets were left over? Come on, church. How many? Are you sure? You don't seem too sure. Twelve? Twelve. Baskets full of leftovers. They followed the Lord's guidance with the less or the little they thought they had to bring to the table. And God multiplied it and blessed it in a tremendous way. I think you and I need to respond to God's guidance in spite of what we think we bring to the table and what we don't bring to the table. Because the reality is, in and of ourselves, we are always insufficient. We never have enough to fulfill the need that's there, to accomplish the will, the plan, the purpose for the glory of God. And yet, as we bring what we have to the table, God blesses it as we follow his leadership and his guidance, and he multiplies it and blesses us and those around us. Fourthly, we need to rely upon God's provision. Take a look at the text. He says, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. And is a conjunction linking what was said before to what is about to be said. He is reference to God, to Jehovah, to Yahweh. He will make straight, or he will make smooth. In other words, God will remove the obstacles or the opposition. He will make it straight. He will make it smooth. He will allow you to reach your destiny and to reach the place and the purpose that he has for you, he will make straight your path. He will remove the obstacles, he'll take care of the opposition, and he'll get you to where he plans to take you. Last verse, Matthew 14. Turn to Matthew 14. You don't have to keep your finger in your Bible anymore to Proverbs 3. We will not return there. But last illustration, Matthew 4, 28. Actually, let's look at the verse 31 and 32. Christ has uh, commanded his disciples to go out on the lake. He goes up to pray all night long. About 3 to, in the morning, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., he comes back down from the mountain from praying. Notice that the disciples are out about two miles out on the, on the Sea of Galilee. They have not made much progress because the winds and the waves are preventing them from accomplishing what he had asked them to do. There's, a, there's some resistance there from the winds and the waves, and they're trying their best they can to get to the other side. You can't do it. Christ does what Christ can do. He begins to walk on water. He proceeds to walk toward them. And as he's walking toward them, they see a figure coming on the water. And they assume that it's a ghost and even say, it's a ghost. One of the disciples say, it's not a ghost. It's the Lord. Simon Peter, who always opens his mouth and sticks in his foot every time, this time gets it right. And he says, Lord, if you command me, I'll come out and walk on the water toward you. Christ says, come on. It's here what I think that we don't have all that's recorded here. Uh, I'm wondering if, if Simon Peter really had the faith or if the disciples helped him out of the boat. <laughs> Peter, you're cocky, dude. Let me help you out of the boat. You know, Simon Peter probably standing on the side of the boat and said, Lord, if it's you, and they kind of do this. Let me give you a little help. No, I don't think that's true. It's, it, that would be heresy, right? It's not there. But it, I can imagine it would be fun if it was. But Simon Peter steps out of the boat, begins to walk on water. You know the story. The winds and the waves begin to beat up against him. He takes his eyes off of Christ, and he begins to sing. How far do you think he got before he yelled for help? Uh, Simon Peter's a stubborn fella. I think it wasn't until his bottom lip started taking in water. And he finally looked over the Lord and he said, Lord, help. And the Lord reaches down and he picks him up. And, and Christ says something so incredible to me. Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? I don't know about you, but it takes a lot of faith to walk on water. And yet he had little faith. Notice what the scriptures say in verse 31. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But notice what it says 
in verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Simon Peter's a, we don't know how far he is away from the boat, but he's been walking on water until he sank and asked for help. And the Lord immediately reached down and picked him up. And arm in arm, they walked back toward the boat. But it says the wind and the waves didn't stop until when? Until they got in the boat. That means Christ walked on the waves, overcoming the wind that was preventing the disciples from making progress forward until they got into the boat. Christ was always there for Simon Peter, walking through the winds and the waves, the dangers and the difficulties until he was safely on the boat. And it wasn't until they were on the boat that it stopped. We sang about it. I think there are times when we don't see him at work. We don't feel that he's working. We're not aware of his activity. But he never abandons. He never forsakes us. He's always walking beside us. And if we, like Simon Peter, will turn to him and say, Lord, help me. Like the father prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, help me see. Help me know what you're about. Take his arm. And no matter what waves may be beating against you, what circumstances may be trying to defeat you, what the enemy may throw at you, the Lord is always with you, side by side, walking you through the tempest and the storms and the hardships and the difficulties. And there are times it may not stop until you get safely on a boat where it will come to an end. So I don't know where you are today in this journey of faith, but I do know that you can turn to the Lord and He will guide you. He will lead you. He will direct you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your path. It's a promise. Father, thank you for the joy and the privilege and opportunity we've had this day to be challenged by this passage. God, I pray that as you speak and move in our hearts today, that we will reflect the desire to bring glory to you, to honor you, that your will be done, and your kingdom built in us and through us. God, use this day, use this time, use this moment to draw us closer to you in this journey of faith. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you take just a moment to reflect upon what God may be communicating in your heart and life today? What decision is He bringing you to make today? We're going to sing an invitation to Him in a moment. Hey, there's a person here that needs to place their faith and trust in Christ and give Him their all. Recognize and realizing that you can't save yourself, but Christ did all that was necessary on the cross to die for your sin against God and redeem you back into Himself. Would you come today and take Curtis' hand and I want to trust Christ today as my Savior and Lord. Maybe you'd like to become a part of this church family and join this church. Maybe you need to come. Maybe another time, another place, you've already placed your faith and trust in Christ. Today, you need to say, I want to follow Christ in baptism. Become a part of the family of God through the act of baptism and obedience to the Lord. Or maybe there's something else God's placed upon your heart. Curtis is here. Began to pray with you as we go through this time of invitation. God, be glorified in our response. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing.